So next I'll go over a few of the choices that you have in manual. So if I just switch to manual now, it's that M there. And if I turn the camera around so you can see the back, as you can see, there's a lot more information on the LCD monitor than when you're in auto. Don't be put off though, the camera still gives you an introduction to the settings when you select them. And if you do spend a bit more time exploring, you'll soon get familiar with everything. So let's have a quick look through all the settings now. Firstly, you've got this M up here, which stands for manual, and that tells me what mode I'm in. Next, you've got this fraction here. That's the shutter speed, and you can see next to it there are two orange pointers. These pointers denote the dial up here on the body of the camera. When they appear next to a number, it means that you can use the dial to make changes to the function that they're highlighting. In this case, it's the shutter speed. So if I jog this dial here, left and right, you should see the changes to the shutter speed being made accordingly. I'll talk more about how to use this dial and the other buttons on the camera's body later. Next to the shutter speed, you've got the F number, which is this number here. This controls your aperture. In all of the creative modes, the shutter speed and the aperture are linked, but that's not the case in manual. As such, unless you set both of these correctly, you're not going to get the right exposure. Thankfully, to help you out, you've got a light meter, which is this line of numbers here. This is called the exposure level indicator. It's activated when you press the shutter button halfway down, causing the camera to measure the light in the scene. The indicator acts like a spirit level or a balancing scale. Over on the left-hand side, you've got the minus symbol, and over on the right-hand side, you've got the plus symbol. So let's just do that now. If I press the shutter button down to get a meter reading, as you can see, you get this little white square that appears and gives you a meter reading. If it's in the middle like it is now, then that means that you've got a good balanced exposure. If it's over on the minus side of the meter, over this side, then that means that the image is underexposed and will look too dark. And if it's on the right side, over here, this side of the meter, that means that your image will be overexposed and will look too bright. OK, let me show you now how you can adjust the meter reading by jogging this dial here to change the shutter speed. If I take a meter reading, and then if I dial this dial over to this side, I'm increasing the shutter speed now, which means that less light is going to be hitting the sensor. And as you can see, the white square is moving down the meter. Now I'm off the meter, and this small square has appeared to tell me that. If I decrease the shutter speed, effectively letting in more light, the indicator will move to the right of the scale as the image gets brighter. And again, an arrow will appear when I'm off the meter. Next to the F number up here, you've got another important setting that affects your exposure, your ISO. In manual and in the other creative modes, you can select whatever ISO you want. So let's just have a go at that. The touch screen works in the same way that it does in auto. So you just press the Q icon like that. And then you get all these different areas that have become active. If I go up here and press the ISO icon up here, you may have to press it twice to get past this little info screen. Then all of a sudden you've got all these different options that are available. Remember that lower ISOs like 100 and 200 are for shooting in bright, well lit scenes. And the higher ISO numbers, oh, we've lost that, let's just go back in. The higher ISO numbers up here are for shooting in darker environments. You can also select auto, which is this one here but that would be rather self-defeating in manual mode because you'll end up with the camera changing the ISO to compensate for your adjustments to shutter speed and aperture. So all these areas at the top here are for setting your exposure. Below this section, you've got these two settings here. They affect the aesthetic of your image, things like the color and the contrast. The first icon here is your picture style. Let's go to that in the menu. If I press on the Q and then press picture style. Picture styles gives you a selection of different looks for different situations. Each look or style makes adjustments to four things, sharpness, contrast, saturation or colour tone. If we go back into that I can show you some of those. You can play around with the styles to see what you like, but I recommend sticking with neutral, which is this one up here at the end. Neutral gives you a nice, simple, relatively flat look avoiding the tendency some of the other styles have to boost the image's colour, contrast and sharpening. You may also be interested in this style here, monochrome, which is the M. This gives you a black and white photograph. Bear in mind that you can't go back to colour from a monochrome picture, but if you take a picture in colour, you can easily turn it to black and white in your computer. For now, let's just stick with neutral. So if we go back in and select neutral there. 
Next to your pitch style, you've got this icon here, which is your white balance. At the moment, it's set to auto white balance, which is what AWB stands for. White balance refers to the colour of the light in your scene and how your camera interprets this light in the photographs that you take. As you probably know, the colour of light changes. For instance, candlelight is very orange and the light in the morning tends to be blue. Our brains are able to easily adapt and adjust to the different colour temperatures as they change around us. And as a result, we don't really notice the changes in the light's colour temperature. When the camera is set to auto white balance, it's able to adjust in a very similar way. But unfortunately, it does get confused from time to time. This is when you might want to take control of the camera's white balance settings. By setting white as a base against which all of the colours are measured, the camera is able to make sure that everything else looks the colour it should be, no matter what the colour of light. If we go to the white balance menu, if I press on the quick axis and then hit the auto white balance, you can see we've got all these different icons. These are different white balance presets for different situations. For instance, we've got this one here, which is for when we're shooting outdoors in the sun. And then further along, we've got this light bulb here, which is for when we're shooting indoors with the electric lights on. This icon up here at the end, that looks a little bit like an open book, is for when you want to set your white balance manually. What I find is that auto white balance is normally good enough when you're taking photographs. I'd only ever go into the white balance menu if I felt the camera was getting the colours wrong for some reason. For instance, if the scene included a very bold dominant colour like red that was confusing the camera. When shooting video, however, I'd always aim to lock white balance down, either by setting it manually or by choosing one of the white balance presets. That's because you don't want the white balance changing during a shoot. Any changes will make it difficult to edit together different shots from the same scene. But as we're talking about still images now, I'm going to leave it in auto for the time being. So if I leave that in auto and then come out. Now if I press the Q icon again, you can see that there are all these different other things on the monitor that we can look at. If you were to go into the main menu and start turning on the buried functions like GPS, then there'd be even more icons on this monitor. But most of these are functions that aren't essential, so I'll let you explore those in your own time. The only other icon I want to talk about on the monitor is this one here, this L. As I've already mentioned, L stands for large, and it refers to the size and quality of the photos that you're taking. In auto, you can't change this in the quick control screen, but you can in manual. So let's just do that now. If I press the quick control button, and then go over to L, and then if I press that again, as you can see, there are lots of different choices, and as you click through each of them, you'll notice that these numbers at the bottom are changing, and they refer to the different sizes of photographs. Digital images are made up of pixels, which are little square dots of colour, and you can see these clearly when you zoom in on a photograph. The more pixels you have, the higher the quality of the image, and the bigger the size of the file. If I would select L by going into the menu and pressing that one there, I get a photograph that's 5,184 pixels along the top and 3,456 pixels down the side, as it tells you at the top there. Time those together and you get a picture that's made up of 18 million pixels or 18 megapixels. That's the highest pixel count this camera is capable of and it will give you a file size of around 16 megabytes in size. If you select M here, you get a smaller picture that's only 8 megapixels and half the file size. Go down to S, you get a smaller picture still. All of these are different size JPEG files, and there are two choices of image quality for each one, fine and normal. These are symbolised by these different icons here. If I just go back into that. So we've got all these different icons here. We've got L with a smooth quarter circle, and that indicates fine image quality. Next to that, we've got L with this stepped icon, and that indicates normal image quality. Basically, the normal setting is a smaller, more compressed image. There are loads of benefits to using JPEG. They take up less room on your SD card, and they're more convenient to view, use, and share once you've got them off your camera and onto the computer. However, if you're interested in editing your photos, the compression applied to a JPEG file in the camera means that you don't have much to play with in photo editing software. So if you do want to fiddle around with your images, then the best option is to shoot uncompressed photos, which you can do by selecting RAW. If I go back into the menu and then go down here, RAW is just there. So if I click on that, this will give you a .CR2 file that's about 23 megabytes in size. That's much bigger than the largest JPEG, so they will take up a lot more room on your SD card. Bear in mind that you may not be able to view RAW files on your computer, so you may have to install additional plugins or something like Picasa to view your images. Also, you'll need specialist software like Adobe Lightroom to process, compress, and convert the files before they can be shared with others. 
so I'd only recommend using RAW if you're a more advanced photographer. For beginners, stick with JPEGs and to ensure quality, go for the fine L selection. So if I quickly show you how to do that again, press Q, go into the image quality menu and then select L here with the curved quarter circle. And if I press that again to select it, that's that done.